This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Hello everyone, my name is Adelina Ratner. I'm one of the two co-chairs of this year's Big Bang Organizing Committee. On behalf of the Organizing Committee and the Graduate School of Management, I'd like to welcome you all to tonight's ninth annual Big Bang final um, awards presentation and um, presentations. Tonight is it, uh, the culmination of a year's worth of hard work for the Big Bang Organizing Committee and our finalists. Um, first of all, I'd like to congratulate our finalist teams on their accomplishments thus far and wish them good luck in tonight's presentations to this audience. This event um, here tonight, as well as the rest of the competition, is entirely student-run. That's been a big effort on the part of this group, and I'd like to thank them all. Um, see, just to summarize the competition thus far, so you guys, so you know um, how the competitors have come come to be here tonight. Um, in the fall, they attended a kickoff and some networking events, some team formation events, as well as some educational workshops. Um, the real competition began in the spring. They submitted their executive summaries. Um, we got 19 of those this year. Um, the executive summaries were judged and the semi-finalists were announced. Um, those semi-finalists wrote business plans up to 35 pages in length. Um, we got 13 of those submitted including five from the Little Bang competition. Uh, the business plan judging went on and the five finalists that you will see here tonight were announced. Earlier today, they presented their business plans to judges in a closed door session and the winners have been selected and will be announced at the end of tonight's event. Um, in addition, the finalists will present tonight in order to show you their hard work as well as um, compete for the People's Choice Award, which you all will be able to vote on tonight. Um, the awards uh, for first prize, $15,000. The runner-up will receive $5,000 and the People's Choice Award will be $3,000. Tonight, you will get to vote for the People's Choice Award. Um, there'll be one ballot per person. Those are in your programs. Uh, voting will occur after the last team presentation. Um, and vote for your favorite business idea, presentation, and team, the one you would fund if you were a venture, venture capitalist. Enjoy the rest of the program. Um, I'd like to introduce my co-chair, Julia Bark. Before we get started, I'd like to um, thank some people without whom th this competition would not be possible. Um, first, we'd like to thank our sponsors. Um, who have supported the Big Bang this year. In particular, DLA Piper, who um, is the sponsor of tonight's event. Without the generous support of these sponsors, the Big Bang would not be possible. I would also like to thank our judges. We have these judges who have volunteered their time to read the executive summaries, the business plans, and then judge the pitches at today's um, presentation. Um, not only did they volunteer their time to judge, but they also provided vital feedback that helped the teams along their way. I'd also like to thank the mentors who were assigned to the teams who made it into the semi-finalist round. These mentors uh, were a great tool for um, the teams, and they donated immense amount of time, and we would like to thank them. And finally, I'd like to thank our partners, the Center for Entrepreneurship and the Graduate School of Management, who provide the Big Bang with vital support. And with that, I would like to introduce the Dean of the Graduate School of Management, Nicole Biggert. How many people here think that this is the finals for American Idol? <laughs> it's on tonight, but this is not it. It's the UC Davis idol, because we're going to idolize uh, some people here tonight. Um, I want to welcome you all to, uh, I see all of you to what I think is one of the most fun and frankly important events that we hold on campus every year. 
This is, uh, uh, I, I see alumni, I see students, I know that there are judges out there, there are sponsors out there. Uh, uh, you represent uh, the energy that makes this event possible, the energy and the support that makes this possible. And I just want to thank you I, I'm, and welcome to what is going to be a fun night for us all. This was launched nine years ago, and I was at the first one. I'll tell you, we have come a long way. Uh, this has been a process. It's been a gift by the GSM students to the uh, UC Davis community and to the business community uh, in, in our area. Uh, this is entirely student run and it is not at all funded by the Graduate School of Management, which I can tell you after yesterday's election is a really good thing. We're, <laughs> we are, we're all going to be looking for self-sufficient, self-supporting activities. I, I think what you're about to see is something uh, something magical happens when top quality science, engineering, thinking is technical thinking is matched with the skills of business. Uh, this is a great science uh, and uh, engineering campus. Uh, we bring in more than half a billion dollars of funding, uh, in, which is in basically our R and D lab here at UC Davis. But nothing happens unless it goes out the door. And these students help spark the entrepreneurial spirit and, uh, and our uh, business community helps to pre uh, present the skills that will take those ideas and have them make a difference in the world. So this is truly important beyond what you see today. It's changing the culture of UC Davis and I am very proud of the people who, who are part of it. I want to especially thank uh, the two uh, co-chairs of this year's Big Bang. You just met them, Julia uh, Barg and Adelina Ratner. There's a lot of work that goes, uh, that goes on all year long to make this happen. Thank you again for coming, and uh, I can't wait to see what's next. Thank you, Dean Biggert. And now I'd like to present our first team of the evening, Vision Quest. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming out tonight. It means a lot to us that you're here. And also, especially thank you to all the mentors and judges who have spent countless hours reviewing our plan and everyone else's plan. Um, it's really been a learning experience. And uh, I'm very excited to tell you a little bit about our company, um, which has really matured throughout this process. Um, but before I get started, please just think to yourself, um, if, if you know someone, a family member, um, a friend, who suffers from diabetes, and the things that they need to do on a daily basis to manage um, the, their illness, check their insulin, manage the food that they eat, and one thing you may not realize is that people who have diabetes or are at risk for diabetes are at risk to lose their sight due to a condition called diabetic retinopathy. And our business identified this, this, this real problem and we, we set out to, to develop a system to provide, at rest, to, to provide access to the at-risk community through sight-saving medical care. And that, that's, that's what our business is about. And I'm gonna talk about, uh, first, what is diabetic retinopathy? I'm gonna talk about VisionQuest value proposition, what makes us unique from other companies providing services in this space. I'm gonna talk about our technology, which is patentable and protects us from competition in certain regards. I'm gonna talk about our innovative business model and how we share revenue in order to install kiosks in national retailers. I'm gonna talk about our, our growth approach, how we're intending to go to the market and the financial health of our business. I'm gonna talk about the environment in which we're gonna operate. And finally, our management team and advisory board who we're very excited about. So first, diabetic retinopathy. Diabetic retinopathy is the leading cause of blindness in America. It's caused by damage to the blood vessels in the retina, and over 24 million Americans who have diabetes are at risk, and another 54 million others who are pre-diabetic or at risk for gestational diabetes are also at risk for the condition. The good news is that it's highly treatable. 75% of the cases of diabetic retinopathy can be treated if they are detected. And the test is affordable. Nearly every single insurance provider, including Medicare and Medicaid, covers the diabetic retinopathy scan. So the question that we asked ourselves 
is why are 50 people still losing, 50 Americans still losing their sight every day due to diabetic retinopathy? And the reason is, is that between 50 and 75% of those who are at risk do not receive the scans that they need due to the inconvenience and cost of getting access to those scans. Individuals today need to go see their general practitioner, pay a copay, make an appointment to see their ophthalmologist, pay another copay, and this process of cost and inconvenience causes between 50 and 75% of those who are at risk not to receive the scans. Our business seeks to provide these people with scans. We do that by linking this at-risk segment with the sight-saving retinal scans through three things. First is our network of diabetic retinopathy scanning kiosks. These kiosks will be installed in the medically supervised healthcare clinics of national retailers, such as Walmart, Walgreens, and CVS, to provide the, the, the sight-saving scans to the at-risk community. In our kiosks is embedded proprietary software, which helps our physicians prioritize patients so they can spend more time on patients that have at-risk eyes and less time on patients who have healthy eyes. This lowers our costs and increases the accuracy of our service. Finally, every single scan that VisionQuest processes is viewed in detail by a board-certified ophthalmologist. This is done virtually through our virtual telemedicine clinic. Now I'm going to talk a little bit quickly about our, our technology. Our technology leverages some recent advance, advances in automated retinopathy detection. Basically what it does is it takes a digital image of the retina, it maps that image using computer program in order to identify the vessels, and then the computer sections off that image in order to identify areas of the vessels that are damaged and at risk for retinopathy. In doing this, what the computer program provides the physician with is a risk profile for each patient. And that's um, symbolized through, th through the, the graph right there. And what this enables our physicians to do is spend more time on patients that are at more risk and less time on patients that are at less risk. And what it, it does for our business is it lowers our costs and enables us to share the, the saved revenue with our partners. Our business uh, really operates in the, in the environment that exists today. So recently, um, insurance companies have instituted CPT code 92250, which means that all diabetic retinopathy scans will be reimbursed at 65%. What we do is we share that 60, er, sorry, $65. We share that $65 with our retail partners and our manufacturing partners in order to fund kiosk installation. So $20 of the $60 goes to um, our manufacturing partners who we work with to develop the scanning kiosks. Then $20 of that $65 goes to our retail, retail partners in order to fund the re retail real estate we need to gain distribution and access the market. $25 is left to cover vision costs expenses. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about our, our growth approach. We really are looking at growth in three phases. First is development, and that's going to occur during 2009. During that phase, we really focus on perfecting our software and creating partnerships with manufacturers and retailers. It's not until 2010 until VisionQuest is going to go into what we call our soft launch, where we're just looking at two markets, LA and Miami. These are two markets with a high incidence of diabetics where we can go into on a limited capability and test out our software, test out our network, make sure we've got all the bugs ironed out. At that time, we're going to go into national expansion, adding on higher incidence diabetic uh, markets of Texas, Illinois, Michigan, and the Northeast Corridor. By 2013, we will have nearly 2,000 kiosks installed nationally, which generates 1.7 million scans per year. That translates to $113 million in revenue in 2013 with earnings before interest and taxes of $21 million at a gross margin of 29%. So as you can see from the graph, the majority of our, of our revenue is shared with our partners. And by sharing the revenue, we enable installation of our kiosks. We break even in the fourth quarter of 2011 and end 2013 with a positive cash balance in our bank accounts of $18 million which we can share with our investors or reinvest into our company. So finally, VisionQuest really has two sustainable advantages. 
Our primary sustainable advantage is our diagnostic software. The diagnostic software protects us from competition by making it difficult for other providers to read the data that comes from our kiosks and provide revenue and cut us out of that market space. The, the software also reduces our costs by prioritizing scans so our doctors can analyze more scans in less time. We reduce our overall operating costs and share that saved revenue with our partners. Also, our business is highly scalable. Because we have very little fixed costs, because the, ins the major capital expenditure of our business is covered by our manufacturing partners, we're able to scale up or down as the market demand fluctuates. This, reduce risks, this reduces, reduces the risk for our business and our investors. The environment in which we'll be operating is fairly new. There are two companies, ITEL and Redisher, that provide diabetic retinopathy scans to general practitioners, although at this point, no one is providing these scans on a national basis. Our business disperses value to all of our partners. To retailers, we add an enhanced service and a reason to drive traffic to their store, as well as incremental revenue, 30% that we talked about earlier. To manufacturers, we, we greatly expand their network. Today, they sell to ophthalmologists, but with our service, they'll be able to tap into that 50 to 75% of the market that doesn't re receive scans that they need today. To insurers, we actually improve their cost structure as well. By providing scans, which causes them to outlay cash at this point, they prevent blindness, and the cost of blindness far outweighs the cost of providing these scans. To physicians, and it, we drive business to their, to their practices. By identifying patients that need the laser treatment for retinopathy, we're driving traffic into the physician's um, practice. Finally, I'll just conclude by saying that Vision Quest addresses a large market with a very serious and large pain, the potential to lose sight. A mere 2.3% penetra penetration into this market generates $113 million in our fifth year of operation. We have a great management team assembled here to, to lead the team, most of whom are graduate students at UC Davis. We also have assembled an advisory board with some great experience in um, retailing of medical devices, including Michael Grishkin, CEO of Comprehensive Medical Services, a 10 clinic chain of preoperative screening clinics, Dr. Joan Helmus, who's an optometrist here in Davis, Craig Bennett, who's a biomedical engineer at the Cleveland Clinic Foundation with experience with medical imaging technology and automated detection software. So in conclusion, I just want to thank everyone for listening to our pitch about our business. We're going to be going on to Princeton in two weeks to pitch this business again. And uh, thanks again. We do hire Davis MBAs. Thank you, Sam and Vision Quest. Um, now it's my pleasure to introduce to you our next speaker, Roger Akers. Well, nine years we've been doing this, and each and every year our teams distinguish themselves again and again. They, this is a great group of people that we've had this year to uh, participate and battle it out. I would have to, I think my judges would agree with me that it's been the, it was the toughest deliberation, uh, I think in recent memory at least, and maybe in, in the, for the whole thing. So uh, tonight they needed a, a filler, so they got me up here to speak a bit. <laughs> and Bob, what can you say in five minutes? You know, you, not much, <laughs> not much, <laughs> a lot, yeah, there you go. But uh, I thought I would uh, start out by saying that, are you, you want to start a business? Are you people absolutely crazy? You can't do it. Why would you ever, not with the, even with the economic conditions notwithstanding, why would you ever start a business now or ever? The simple answer is no. Why would you ever do something like that? First of all, are you really an entrepreneur? Really? Are you really willing to work 14-hour days? Bob and Dearest would say, that's 18 hours, Roger. You're right, Bob. And six or seven days a week. Are you willing to make less in the next five to seven years than if you went out and got a real job? 
That's a statistical fact, by the way. And that realizing that you have a one in nine chance of success once you go out there and start that business. And are you willing to risk your relationships with all the people who care about you in the world? <laughs> That's what it means to be an entrepreneur. More about that later. You have to have a team when you start these early stage businesses. Look at these fine young people and these fine young teams. Aren't they amazing? It's a lot like getting married, some of these relationships. The smartest engineer in the world, but he smells every day. The best sales manager ever, but she is late every day. And the best partner you could ever have beers with, but what does he do? <laughs> oh, wait a minute. His dad gave us 100 grand. <laughs> Speaking of capital investment, where do you get those hard to find dollars? Grandma's good. She doesn't even ask about valuation. Your wife's dad's loaded. He'll never tell you no. And, my, and your dad's bank, they should be a great source with three years financials. So honey, let's mortgage the house. We've all seen that happen before, haven't we? Remember what I said about relationships? And then there's that first board of advisors. Of course, there's grandma. She's great. And then there's Uncle Ralph. He really likes me. And my wife's father, we all remember, he gave us the 100 grand. And then my best friend. We're off to a great start. We're going to fail right out of the chute. <laughs> and of course, then we have to concentrate on the idea. Now, over the years, I don't know how many business plans some of us have looked at, but I think I'm well over 10,000 business plans, somewhere over 10,000. I can't say I've read them all. <laughs> Jim, I've thrown a bunch of them away. <laughs> but the best idea ever, reselling mother's milk, Scott Lynette's favorite. That's okay, Scott. We get it. <laughs> hey, I put the manufacturer right up there on the food chain, bud. Of course, there's the ever-present innovation to the beer bong and a bigger black light or the gut buster. That's always great. And on and on and on. But then on a more serious note, start a business. Are you crazy? Well, I'll be a little more serious now. The people in this audience and the people that are participating at this level are the best educated, the best connected, the most refined, the most funded, and the most creative, innovative generation in our history. And we have to support that dynamic and that function as hard as we can going into the future to help us come through some of the problems that face our world and our existence. And that's why we do what we do, and that's why this program is so important. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roger. Um, and now it's my pleasure to introduce our next team, Ultra V. Good evening. Thank you for being here tonight and uh, allowing us to come and present our business to you. My name is Mananya Chunsanchai and I am here to present, uh, to represent Team Ultra V. So what I am here to talk to you about tonight is water. And as we all know, water has to be disinfected before it's, we drink it. It has to be disinfected before we let our children play in it. And wastewater has to be disinfected before uh, we dump it back out into the environment. And as you can see, there's a lot of different needs for disinfection, um, but what we're talking about today is actually wastewater. 
Um, and uh, with all these different uh, kinds of uh, disinfection needs, uh, the current method that's used is chlorine. Um, but over the past two decades, there have been uh, some improvements in UV technologies, and, uh, but all of the existing UV technologies, they're all based upon the same principle. They're all variations on the same principle, that they place UV lamps inside water. Um, and these existing UV systems all require a lot of different inf infrastructure, they require a lot of maintenance, they're very energy intensive. Um, so that is where Ultra-V comes in. And we provide a solution where we are placing xenon pulse lamps outside, not in contact with the water. That coupled with the innovative hydrodynamics that have been developed here at UC Davis, um, we are offering a low maintenance, energy efficient, cost effective option that has a very low, low overall footprint uh, compared to existing UV technologies. And we estimate that we're going to be able to provide that a, a 20 to 35% less total cost of ownership um, than other current disinfection options. So I'm just going to give a brief overview of the existing uh, disinfection options out there. As I mentioned, uh, chlorine is what is generally used right now, but it was actually, I didn't realize this until last week when the professor told me this, but it was actually the first WMD that was used in the early 1900s. Um, and as we all know, chlorine is also very dangerous. Um, it's dangerous to store, it's dangerous to transport, um, and it's also a known carcinogen. Um, and it doesn't address the concept of emerging contaminants. Emerging contaminants are those uh, personal care products and the drugs and substances that are in the water that, um, that get dispelled into the water that, we need, to, that uh, we need to take care of and regulations are pushing toward that. There are currently two different kinds of UV disinfection technologies and we're calling those the first generation of UV 1.0 and UV 1.1. Um, the system that you see here in the middle is actually the UC Davis wastewater treatment plant. And as you can see, there's a lot of infrastructure required um, with, with the systems. There's concrete channels, there's cranes for man, uh, maintenance. Um, so overall, they're very capital intensive, extensive infrastructure that's needed for these systems. Um, and again, what I had mentioned, that one of the main problems of the existing systems is that the, the lamps are still in contact with the water. So the lamps will grow some algae on them and they need to be cleaned um, every month, if not more. Um, also, one of the main challenges with the existing UV systems with uh, the lamps being placed in the water is that they cause what are called hydraulic losses. And hydraulic losses are, um, Basically, if you put something in the, in, in the way of uh, flowing water, it's going to slow that water down. So the pumps are going to have to pump harder in order to get that water to the right flow rates. And so that, of course, is going to increase your electric demand. That's the same problem with the closed vessel systems. Even though they have less infrastructure, they still have this uh, challenge with hydraulic losses, which is where our technology comes in. We're introducing Ultra-V, the next generation UV 2.0. What you see here is an early prototype that was created here at the UC Davis campus. And what you can see here is a stable vortex being created um, within the cylinder. And the UV lamps would be placed outside the cylinder, um, uh, allowing for a uniform dosage from the UV. Um, this is important because you might Imagine yourself sunbathing. You know that if you're out there in the middle of the day, you're getting UV, la UV light um, at a very intense level in the middle of the day. And so it's the same concept here that you're receiving, uh, the water is receiving more and more dosage as it's going around. And it's estimated that it would receive approximately, four, uh, I'm sorry, 28 doses of UV um, before the water gets expelled out of there. Our system also uses xenon lamps, which, um, are um, a thousand times more intense than the existing lamps that are out there. And it's also an inert gas, so it's not dangerous. Existing lamps out there use mercury, which is a, a heavy metal and it's dangerous and you have to pay to dispose of it. Um, so that increases all the uh, different costs that go with it. Um, and our system is also modular and scalable. It doesn't require much maintenance. Um, and so to summarize the advantages of Ultra-V, over the other technologies are that because of the basic premise that our lamps are outside of the water, it's going to uh, 
eliminate the hydraulic losses, the lamp fouling, which means the lamp's getting dirty, um, and which is also going to reduce the maintenance, make them more energy efficient, and um, we also eliminate uh, the toxic mercury that's being used. So I'll just talk a little bit about the market opportunity. Um, POTW stands for Publicly Owned Treatment Works. These are um, the municipal wastewater treatment plants. There's about 21,000 um, in the United States, and in California alone, there's about 850. Um, and that is going to be our initial target market. Uh, existing wastewater treatment plants, about 21% of them use UV right now, so that's not going to be our target market. Our target market is going to be the people who haven't already switched to UV, to UV and that's going to be the 75% of the wastewater treatment plants that are still using chlorine. So that's our total addressable market. The go-to-market strategy, um, the value chain of the wastewater treatment municipal systems is pretty complex. We're go I'm going to give you just a really quick summary of it. The wastewater treatment plant, what you need to know is that they're the end users of this technology, and the key players in this, uh, in this value chain are going to be the independent manufacturing representatives. They have the relationships with the wastewater treatment plants, they have the relationships with the engineering firms, and then hopefully we will be able to have a relationship with them as well. Um, we plan on partnering with them so that they would be able to use their relationships and their, um, and their connections to include our technology as they sell these to the wastewater treatment plants. And just to complete the value chain, you can see that the contractors are actually the ones that install the systems. Our business model is based upon selling the systems directly and also with the ongoing maintenance contracts and we would be paying a fee to the manufacturing representatives for their services. And a cost comparison here, as I mentioned earlier, that the Ultra-V system would be able to be offered at a 20 to 35% less total cost of ownership, mainly because of the lower total initial costs. Although Ultra-V may be more expensive than the existing open uh, channel systems, it requires a lot less infrastructure. So the uh, total cost over the life of the product is going to be less. So as you can see, Ultra-V is well positioned. Uh, amongst its competitors because of its ease of maintenance and the disinfection efficacy that we will reach with our xenon pulse lamps outside of the water. And just a few milestones that I'd like to point out. We are in the final stages of approval from receiving funding from the California Energy Commission of $150,000. We plan on using that money to complete the prototype and the UC Davis wastewater treatment plant has actually agreed to let us test this product once we get that prototype built. Um, and at that time, we'll be able to show the manufacturing reps the technology, and uh, they'll be able to begin to start the sales process with uh, the wastewater treatment plant customers. And also within that first year, we also plan on seeking some funding of $2.5 million. The penetration is relatively slow at first, but as we uh, begin to gain adoption as a viable uh, technology in the market. Uh, we plan to have some steady growth until year five where we plan to expand beyond California. So we have an outstanding management team, Elizabeth and Lamartini, who is the environmental engineer we've been working with um, and an emerging venture analyst with the Energy Efficiency Center. Unfortunately, she could not be here tonight. Um, myself, I'm also uh, an emerging venture analyst with the EEC and a an, uh, second year MBA student here at the GSM. We also have James Bui, who's sitting here in the front row, who is a first year MBA student and has 11 years of sales and marketing experience. And also here in the front row, we have the inventor of the technology, Professor Bassam Yunus, who is one of our advisors and a professor here in civil engineering. And uh, we have Carol Enferrati, who works with the California State Water Resources Board, Lance Edling, who works for McWong Environmental and Energy Group, and they do a lot of work with wastewater. And then we also have Rob Rameau, who is a GSM alum and working with California American Water. So just to summarize, we do have a patent pending, um, and we believe that we have this because of our distinct te technological advantage over existing UV systems. Um, and we believe that we are well positioned to address all the key drivers that are pushing wastewater treatment plants toward UV. Um, and we feel that with the funding from the California Energy Commission that we'll be able to complete the prototype uh, within the next year and, and get 
the product tested and out to market. So thank you everyone for letting us present today. It's now my pleasure to introduce our next finalist, Leighton Harvest. Good evening, everyone. I'm excited to be here, maybe a little too excited. <laughs> but what I'm going to talk to you tonight is a pro I'm going to talk to you tonight about a product that has the potential to change the way farmers in California and around the world make irrigation decisions. But before I do that, I'd like to introduce you to my partner who couldn't be here tonight. He's that good-looking, hard-working guy in the picture behind me. It's Tom Shaplin. He's also the inventor of the Layton Harvest System. So what is the Layton Harvest System? What it is is the first tool available to growers that allows them to measure crop water usage on a field level that is, that is both accurate enough for them to make decisions off of and affordable enough that they don't have to sell their farm to buy it. Now, I'm going to break down our discussion tonight into three key parts. First, I'll talk to you about the problem that Leighton Harvest seeks to address. Secondly, I'll talk to you about the size of the market. And then finally, if we have time, I'll get into the business model. All right. So at the root of the problem is water. Farmers are currently making their irrigation decisions based on mostly intuition and experience as opposed to actual measurements. What that leads to is that sometimes farmers underwater, which causes the plants to be dehydrated, leads to reduced yields, and extreme cases can even cause plant deaths. Now what's more common is that farmers actually over-irrigate. Now over-irrigation is problematic on three fronts. First, that excess water isn't free. Farmers actually have to pay for it. Secondly, when you over-irrigate, you create an environment that promotes uh, plant problems such as root rot and fruit fungus. Thirdly, over-irrigation leads to a problem that we call denitrification, which is where nitrogen in the soil is washed away by excess agricultural runoff. Now, moreover, when farmers over-irrigate, they're not the only ones who experience problems. The rest of us do actually, too, because along with that nitrogen that's being pulled away, so are all the fertilizers, pesticides, and herbicides that farmers are using as well. In addition, when farmers use water, there's less water for us. Now, I'm certainly not up here to point fingers at farmers and blame our state's water problems on them. They're actually perhaps the most eager player to be part of the solution because their livelihood is based on having enough water to feed their crops. The, the real issue here is that thus far, nobody's been able to provide farmers with the technology that can both accurately and affordably assess plants' needs until now. So what we have is auto-calibrated surface renewal, which is the only currently available technology capable of directly measuring the amount of water moving from plants into the atmosphere. So to understand what I'm talking about, I need to walk you through a little bit of the science behind it. So when I say water moving from the plants up into the atmosphere, what I'm talking about is a process called evaporative transpiration, commonly referred to as ET. Now, some really smart scientists, particularly here at UC Davis, have actually come up with an equation for figuring out the rate of ET. Farmers care about ET because if you know about how much water is leaving your plants, then you have a pretty good idea how much water you need to apply. So the equation I'm about to tell you goes like this. The total amount of solar energy absorbed by an ecosystem minus the latent heat flux density minus the sensible heat flux density actually equals evapotranspiration. With me? No, OK. So if you're not with me, it's OK. You can just believe me. It's true. And I have another way. I have another way of you for understanding this. So we put our system up above a crop surface. Water then transpires from the plants up into our system. A measurement is made in our system about how much water the plants lost, and that information is then sent to the farmers. And that's what you need to understand. So our core offering is the direct measurement of real-time ET on a field scale level. Farmers get that data output in, in something like what you're going to see on the screen there. Now, it's important for me to stop and let you know that what we are is a data service company and not a consulting company. What I mean by that is we provide farmers with information, but we don't actually provide them with advice on what to use on what to do with the information. There's two reasons behind that. One is that we're outsourcing our sales to a group of professional crop advisors, and we don't want to infringe upon their business. Secondly, we think that since we're going to be selling to such a wide, uh, to farmers who are going to be growing such a wide variety of crops, crops, that they're actually going to be in a better position to take our information and make a decision off it than we are to give them advice on our decision. So now let's look at who our customers are and how we're going to help them. We've broken up our customer segment into two sets, vineyards and agriculture as a whole. We did this for two reasons. One, vineyards are generally the early adopters of technology. And two, our value proposition to vineyards is slightly different than our value proposition to the rest of agriculture. So what makes great wine grapes different than everybody else is that wine grapes don't sell at set market prices. Take Napa Valley, for example. In 2007, the bottom 10% of Cabernet Sauvignon in Napa was selling at less than $2,100 per ton. 
the average price for Cabernet and for the average price for Napa Valley Cabernet was $4,100 per ton, and the top 10% was selling at over $6,000 a ton. Now, there's a whole host of factors that come together to determine the price of grapes, but quality is undoubtedly one of them. When Tom initially conceived the latent harvest system, the whole idea was that he thought he had an idea for how he can help grape growers produce a more valuable crop. What goes on with grapes is that part of producing high quality grapes is actually stressing the vines to a point where you produce more extracted flavors. And the easiest way to do that is to know exactly how much water your plants are using. So in essence, our value proposition to wine growers is that we think we can take bottom tier wine growers and make them mid tier wine growers and make mid tier wine growers top tier wine growers. But so how big is this industry? Well, it's easy enough for us to figure out how big the grape industry is. It's about 1.8 billion. But what's more difficult to figure out, but more interesting to know, is how much of that 1.8 billion is spent on services such as ours. Unfortunately, all of our competitors are small, privately held companies, and they're less than fourth company with uh, with how much their annual revenues are. So instead, we had to do a modified demand side analysis in which we surveyed vineyard owners trying to figure out, A, if they did spend money on services like ours, and B, how much. So using our results, we determined that about 30% of vineyards spend money on services like ours, and those that do spend roughly $40 per acre. That's about 500,000 acres of grapevines in California, giving us a result of about $6 million. Now I know, looking at all the other numbers you've been presented with tonight, $6 million is a drop in the pond. But what you have to keep in mind about the $6 million is that this is an industry in its infancy stage with enormous potential for growth. Secondly, this is just where we plan on getting started. We intend to move on to the rest of the California industry in the following two years. Now, the rest of California agriculture, we plan on, we have a different value proposition for because it's predominantly selling at market set rates, which we can't affect. What we can do, however, is help them reduce their cost of goods sold through using less water. Now, as you all know, California is in its third straight year of severe drought. The interesting thing about being late in harvest is that as water becomes more valuable, so do our services. And one thing, one thing about California agriculture is becoming clear. People are starting to see the writing on the walls and realizing that water is important. And the way we've irrigated in the past can't be the way we irrigate in the future. However, when you have a problem as severe as California's, as a drought in California, there's going to be a whole host of people trying to sell you a solution. These are just a short list of our competitors. Uh, this is one of their competing weather stations they have behind us. They can actually do a lot of things that we can't do. And so when we first started checking out these guys, we became very intimidated and at one point even considered throwing in the towel. But after we talked to farmers about it, we learned that the one thing they can't do, the one thing we're really good at, is the one thing farmers are really interested in, direct measurement of ET. Now, if you go to their website, these guys will tell you they can do ET, but what they're doing is actually an indirect measurement using a, what's called as the penman monteith equation. Unfortunately, that equation was only meant to be used over crop surfaces like grass that are half inch tall and fully irrigated. Now, it's a little bit confusing, so I'll show you a chart to see what I'm talking about. This is actually the kind of output that our system is going to provide to farmers. And what this is, is a week's worth of data from a vineyard in Napa Valley last year. If you look at the yellow line on top, that's the indirect estimation of ET using our competitor's technology. The blue line on bottom is a direct measurement of ET using the latent harvest system. Farmers, throughout the course of this week, if somebody had irrigated using the yellow line on top, they would have applied 13,000 gallons of water per acre too much. So you can see how this can add up and become quite significant. So now we can talk about the business model. Another thing that separates us from our competitors is how we plan on selling the product. Whereas most of our competitors sell you a piece of hardware and then charge you a yearly service fee, we're actually just going to charge one flat yearly service fee for an information service. We're doing this because we think that what growers want isn't more equipment, it's better information. Now our sales and distribution strategy is a bit different than our competitors as well. Instead of us having a sales force, we're going to hire out or we're going to outsource our sales force to the people that growers trust most. The people that growers trust most are certified pest advisors or CPAs. Now what CPAs are are essentially crop doctors. They're licensed by the state of California to to uh, prescribe essentially services to vineyards. So if you, or not vineyards, crops as a whole. But so if you have a farm in California and you want to apply herbicide or pesticide, you actually need them to write you a prescription to do so. So these are the people that farmers trust and we're gonna get them on our side by offering them a 10% commission on all sales that close. And once they see that the benefits that we can provide for their customers, we think they'll surely come on board. Now pricing was a difficult uh, decision for us because most of our competitors seem more concerned with market share than with profitability. 
sustainability. So even though we'd like to use a value and use pricing where we can share the water savings that our customers are receiving, the way our competitors are handling this is making it difficult for us to price the way we'd want. So what we're going to do instead is look at what our competitors price and charge a small premium on top of that, which turns out to be about $3,000 a year for our service. Now this leads to the question, how long can we be the only people operating this service for? And the answer is, well, that depends. Because we're currently in work with Tech Transfer here at UCD trying to patent our technology, but if that doesn't work out, we have a contingency plan. And what that is, is we're going to enter into a data sharing model with our customers, whereas we retain partial ownership of the data. Therefore, two years from now, if somebody were to reverse engineer our technology and come to market with it, we would have this mountain of data that we could package with our current service to come together to form a long-term competitive advantage. So the team consists of Tom Shaplin. He's the inventor of the technology. He recently finished his master's in horticulture and agronomy here at UC Davis. He's currently down finishing up his final research project in New Zealand studying vine stress management. You've got me, and then you've got Dr. Richard Schneider, who you guys don't know, but probably should. He's, <laughs> no. he's, he's the leading voice in evaporative transpiration research in the world, probably. Chris Storm is a viticulturalist for Vino Farms, which manages over 5,000 acres in Lodi. He's also a certified CPA. And part of their board. And that brings me to where we are today. So when Tom gets back two weeks from now, the first thing we're going to do is go out to Vino Farms Incorporated in Lodi and out to Icon Estates in Napa Valley. Icon Estates is the premium brand for Constellation, the largest wine in the world, and set up two of our beta systems. Now we're really pleased to report that because it not only proves that we're beyond the concept development stage, uh, and in, we're actually into the product launch stage. Now, we know there's some things about our business that are different, and we're not really a classic VC model, nor are we the most experienced team. But we think some of those things are a strength. We might be the only two guys young and dumb enough to try to attack a market like vineyard crop monitoring and think we can stake out a claim for ourselves. So with that, that's our contact information. If you guys have any information, I'd like to... All right, thank you, Michael. Now, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Scott Lynette. Okay, so I could tell by the applause and the looks and the faces of you folks in the audience as Roger was speaking that he did an extremely thorough job of convincing you that we're all crazy for being involved in this business plan competition stuff, whether you're a student or whether you're a venture capitalist or an investor. What I'm going to talk about for the next couple minutes is why that's actually a good thing and why it's so important. Roger hinted at it at the end of his talk. And because I'm a simple venture capitalist, I can only remember three things at a time. And so these are the three things that I want you to take away of why the Big Bang in particular is so important. You get to change the world, you get to improve our collective fortunes, and you get to lower your risk all at the same time. What a deal, right? So I thought it would be interesting to look at some examples of how other companies who've participated in business plan competitions have changed the world. So here are a few. Back in 1965, before Yale even had a business plan competition, there was a business plan written by a student, and that company turned into FedEx. It's now still a public company today. It's got a $17 billion market cap. Everyone in this room has heard of it, and it changed how people deliver packages, both to businesses and to residences. Here's another example that's more recent from the MIT business plan competition. It's Akamai. This is a $3.7 billion market cap public company, and they deliver media over the internet. It's one of the biggest companies in its space. 1-800-CONTACTS was from Brigham Young in 1995. And this is still a private company, but on their website, they even say in 2006, they had revenue of almost $300 million. And it's growing today. It's the world's largest retailer of contact lenses. Pretty interesting company. One that's close to home, and even if it's not a UC Davis company, it's still a UC company, um, which is World of Good, which is a company that we funded out of the business plan competition there from Berkeley in 2005. This is a private company with several million dollars in revenue and national distribution through companies like Whole Foods. And they provide fair wages for artisans in the developing world who are selling their products in the United States. It's a great little company and a social venture as well. So these are examples of multiple types of businesses that have all come out of competitions like this. And it's a, it's a good demonstration that you really actually can change the world by participating in this. So what about improving our collective fortunes? And you know, Roger mentioned this at the end of his talk. You know, we're in kind of an economic mess. 
And getting ourselves out of it is not going to come from big companies. It's going to come from entrepreneurs. So if you look at, um, that's right, we could have a little, little applause for that. So when you think about job creation and wealth creation and where the next generation of entrepreneurship and angel investors are going to come from, it's going to be from successful entrepreneurs who grow and sell their companies and then turn around and help those entrepreneurs who come after them. So you know, I think it's now the case something like 20% of the jobs in America are from companies that either are or were once venture capital funded. It's a pretty significant number. And that number will rise in the future as more and more of these companies come out of schools. And you know, in the last presentation, I think it was pretty prescient to hear them say, you know, we may be the only people young and dumb enough to try this. One of the things that's great about young entrepreneurs who are coming out of schools is that you know, you, you're willing to try things that no one else is willing to try. And maybe if you had more experience, you'd say, I'd never be able to do that. But despite the odds that Roger quoted, one out of nine, you know, one out of nine do make it and maybe accomplish something that everyone else thought was impossible. So that brings us to the last point, which is how do, you how do you do all of this and get all these great benefits and lower your risk at the same time? Well, for starters, you're in an environment where you're at school and everyone wants to help you. You're exposed to the mentors and the judges and the network of investors and lawyers and accountants, all of who want to give you free advice while you're participating in this, not to mention the faculty and the other people who are full-time here at the school. Uh, if you want to win this business plan competition, you better get started. Because when we're sitting in that room deliberating as judges, we want to see that this company is actually going to happen. We want to see some evidence that you're really going to do this thing before we vote you as the winner of the competition. And this is really an opportunity to stress test your idea in an environment where you might be able to convince yourself that you know, you've got that job offer, you're graduating school, but in fact, maybe I've learned enough that this business is real and I actually want to start it. So in summary, you know, th three opportunities, and it's really important if you're a student to participate, and if you're a sponsor, to keep backing the Big Bang. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Um, now I'd like to introduce our fourth finalist team, Emergent Designs. Good evening. My name is Reed Bryson. With me here tonight is Libby Earthman. We are co-founders of Emergent Designs, and we are here to introduce to you the world's first full-length waterproof outerwear skirts. It's true. Great, so rain skirts were a solution for me. Reed and I lived in the Pacific Northwest for seven years. And during that time on my morning commute to work, I was often dressed like this and I had no way to cover my lower body. So I just kept looking around. Surely somebody makes this, I kept thinking, right? It's gotta be on the market. Turned out nobody made this. So I made my own. And as it turned out, when I would walk around in public, people would stop me. They'd say, where did you get that? Where do I buy mine? I said, huh, interesting. So I went to the local sporting goods um, manufacturer and said, hey, Kit, what do you think about this idea? He literally put his head in his hands and he said, oh, that's brilliant. He said, yeah, so you go ahead and go nail your, um, you've nailed your idea, so go ahead and go nail your design. See if you can't get utility patent protection on that. So that's exactly what we did. Um, so why rain skirts? Here, we're just going to pass this over. Well, we actually have one of our three models here tonight, and Libby is going to demonstrate it as it's a fairly unique and novel product. Um, as you can see, it takes about two seconds to put on, does not require removing your shoes or appearing to take your pants off in public, <laughs> and it provides full lower body coverage. So, as you just saw, again, that is really convenient and that's really critical. If you want somebody to use something, you gotta make it easier for them. Um, secondarily, this has the potential to really save customers money. So when you think about people who are gonna use this, a, a lot of them that are gonna be in an urban environment. Think about how many times you're gonna hail a cab in New York City to go that three blocks um, during a storm. If you can just wrap something on and go, you're gonna save a lot of money. And finally, what you couldn't tell just from looking at it, what is also inherent in the product, is that this has a real eco appeal. This fabric that we're using, it's 100% recycled content, and it's 100% recyclable. Getting this fabric was actually um, a really long journey for us, and um, we'll talk more about that later in the presentation. Okay, this solved a problem. Why wasn't the market actually addressing it as it was? Um, on the bottom, we have clothing compatibility, so what's gonna work with what you're already wearing, um, and then coverage coming up the top. 
Umbrellas. Everybody knows an umbrella. Um, much like this microphone, you're going to have to hold it at all times, so it's not entirely compatible with everything else you might be doing. Doesn't provide great coverage for wind and driving rain. Up here you have rain pants. So rain pants, um, they provide really great coverage, but again, who wants to take their shoes on and off every time you transition between environments? You also have trench coats. Trench coats provide decent compatibility, okay coverage. And then you have us up here in the sweet spot. You have optimal clothing compatibility, and you also have optimal coverage. So what, is the, um, what does our industry even look like right now? Right now, skirts is outdoor apparel, really hot. Um, the <laughs> hmm. So um, they... The sale of outdoor apparel dresses increased 118% 118 last year. And internet, which will come into play during our go-to-market segment a little later, that's almost one-fifth of all sales are now done on the internet. So that's really important um, in the way that we're developing. So who's our management team? You already met me and Reed. Um, I've raised about $11 million over the past five years for conservation projects in Northern California. I also manage the import and export of six major sporting goods manufacturers. Um, Reed has deep experience in personnel management. Also on our team is Greg Knadison. He is our IT specialist. He's a Wharton, um, Wharton School graduate. Um, William Burnett, he's our CFO, MBA in financial accounting, and he's, he specialized for six years in bringing startups to IPO. Um, now, consultants, we're not going to talk about all of these, although Jim Love is here in the, um, in the audience, but Tam Ravenhill and Erickson Outdoors, that deserves special mention. So, <clears throat> Ericsson Outdoors is a company in the Bay Area, and they actually provide full service production management. So they can do everything for us from procurement to cutting to sewing to shipping. It's, um, it's a very full service, and we will contract all of our production to them. Our advisory board includes Gail Baugh and Adam Noller, um, both industry veterans. So again, coming back to fabric, it's kind of hard to imagine. Fabric is just this banal thing. It's in our life every day. In the outdoor apparel industry, getting your hands on fabric, really difficult. Um, especially this eco-fabric we're using, it's considered kind of the gold of the fabric world. So what we did, um, well just to tell you how hard this is really quickly, um, fabric companies, they don't actually publicize what they sell. They don't tell you who their salespeople are, and it doesn't matter if you find out who their salespeople are, because they're not going to talk to you unless you've been introduced to them. So it's kind of like they don't really want to do business um, at all. So what we had to do was bring in two industry veterans and say, look, this is our idea. We are not going to make another disposable product. So we brought in Adam and, um, Adam and Gail. They talked to the company, made those connections on our behalf, and we are now the only small manufacturer in the US who's actually using this fabric, which creates a garment which is not only recycled, but 100% recyclable at the end of its life. So we did launch in 2008. We just did a test launch. We put a website up. We said, huh, what's going to happen? Turns out 100 people found our website. 100 people bought skirts, approximately. And it's not just me. Other people really like this product. This is an actual customer quote. I'll read it in case you can't read it from the back. I love it, love it, love it. Thank you so much for making such an incredible product. I am so glad I found you. I could jump up and down and scream. So people are pretty stoked about this. Um, <clears throat> so where are these people coming from? We're able to look at our web data to see where people are coming from and kind of break this into um, a geographic area. And we also looked at who are the people that are going to be able to afford this product. Um, they are about $160 each, which is less than market comparable. Um, but geographically, here you have the United States. We're really trying to pinpoint where are the places these are going to be relevant. You also have all of Canada, very cold. Um, <laughs> select areas within the European Union and um, all of Japan. So, and again, the people that are going to be buying this are generally 25 to 65 and enjoying a healthy lifestyle. So we broke that down. How many people actually live, um, live in those target market areas? And it turns out it's about 156 million just in this really um, specific market segment. And how much are those particular people spending on protective outerwear gear at the moment? Within those markets, it's $5.8 billion. So it's a relatively robust market. So the next thing we did was pretty interesting. We actually surveyed our customers. We said, hey guys, so you like our products. You tell us you love them. You use them all the time. What are you using them for? And um, the majority of them said, you know what? These are really relevant to me when I'm commuting. So we said, OK, 
what, where in our target markets, where, how are people commuting? And we looked at the modalities of transportation that are going to be relevant to our products. These include walking, biking, and public transit. And on the, um, on the far left is the US. Turns out we spend only about 10% of our, um, of our commuting time in the, these types of modalities. And as you come across toward me on the graph, um, it really starts to increase. So just for an example, just to kind of give a comparison, if somebody, in, um, somebody who lives in Austria has a four times greater um, opportunity for the need to arise to use our products because they are going to be using the types of transportation that's really relevant to our products. So sales and distribution market, um, distribution roadmap. First, we're going to go into marketing. So really quickly, pro deals. Pro deals are when you give um, discounts to industry insiders. Uh, seeding markets, we're going to be giving away product in select markets in order to create a certain visibility for the product. Social media, so things like Twitter, Facebook, just connecting with people online. Blogs and magazine reviews, not getting into um, paid advertising until year two. So what exactly does this do, and why does this, why do these, um, what we would consider kind of viral marketing techniques, why are they relevant to what we are doing specifically? So what we are trying to do is we are trying to build this tribal brand, this brand where people understand that when they see other people, they are joining in that tribe. Um, and our, within our target markets, one of, the, one of the really important things about building a tribal brand is that excuse me, um, is that there is a certain level of similarity between the um, experiences people are having. And OK, so you have outdoor people. Outdoor people automatically have an affinity for each other. And then commuters. Commuters are sharing the same experience of commuting and getting wet. Um, and that, that rolls down into our distribution. So again, internet, we're going to launch um, on a much wider scale internet year one, um, combining that with institutional um, sales to people like, uh, or groups rather, like Caltrans, um, United States Postal Service. And moving into the retail, we'll, we'll be wholesaling, but moving into the retail environment in years two and three. So um, that's actually relatively, um, relatively straightforward going into the wholesale market. It's really nice in the outdoor industry. Um, there are only a couple events when people actually create these major contracts to sell these products. In the US, it's a, um, it's a an event in Salt Lake City twice a year. It's called Outdoor Retailer. Exact same thing happens in Europe. Exact same thing happens in Asia. So um, we know how to do this. And this is the, these are the venues through which um, most outdoor gear um, is sold. OK, so what are some different ways that we could grow? We know how many people are out there. We have an idea how many people could afford our skirts in the right markets. Um, Let's look at some different projections. So we did a, a more conservative projection, projection, which is the bottom one in red. And we found that we could sell, th th this is actually about a, a quarter million um, of these items in year five. And we'd be addressing 16 one hundredths of 1%. But we'd be have revenues of about um, $10 million. However, if we grow a little less conservatively, a little more optimistically in what we would consider actually pretty realistic, um, we could be selling $2 million a year with um, revenues in, at 160. So just to look at the financials between these two different um, scenarios, as you'll see, years one and two, they're, they're just the same. The difference is that in year three, depending on how many of those contracts we sign at the, um, at the major outdoor retailer venues, we, we believe we're going to get some real traction into Europe. Um, and that's where they diverge. And <coughs> we, we would need an investment of $500,000 in order to start. We can be profitable in year two, regardless of how we, um, how we continue. But in, if we do get a lot of traction during those, um, during those trade shows, we're going to need an additional investment of $2.6 million to buy inventory for year three to really start ramping up our production and distribution. So um, we are going to exit by selling into a larger brand that this will provide a complementary product offering. Um, and this, what you see here is 2.2x to 4x um, acquisition value. That's um, within the range of how people are exiting, other companies are exiting within our marketplace. And depending on the different scenario we take and depending on how much investment capital we would need, um, we could provide a return of inv on investment of 28 to 69x. So that's it. Fantastic. Thank you, Libby. Now I'd like to introduce our final presentation of the evening. 
Biodynamics. Hello, everyone. My name is Michael Mashinchin, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Biodynamics Technology. I'm joined here today by my colleague, Rena Chit, who's our Director of Marketing. We'd both like to thank you for this opportunity to share our vision with you today. Over 250,000 employees injure their backs in the workplace each year, costing employers roughly $14.5 billion. With the rising cost of healthcare and the aging workforce, these costs are expected to grow significantly in the future. Biodynamics Technology is a professional services firm that uses its patented technology to help companies identify and eliminate back injuries in the workplace. Our business is built based upon a professional services model, and we have a technology that we have protected by a patent, and it ha we house a ha proprietary database. Our solution is three times more effective than any competing options out there in the market, and it's been proven through scientific studies at over 200 companies to date. Moreover, as a business, we're in the process of closing our first round of sales with two large Fortune 1000 clients. Now, before we tell you more about our company, allow me to explain the market forces that really create the business need for us to emerge. The total available market for ergonomic consulting services is roughly $2.24 billion. At 21% of that size, the back injury consulting market is $475 million. Now, we've chosen to focus on self-insured companies because these companies really, they self-insure, thus they, play, they pay every single claim dollar out of their own pockets. Thus, every dollar we save them through our services is going to be a direct increase to their profits. Now, we've also identified that five industries comprise of 66% of all back injuries. That's, health, that's retail, healthcare, manufacturing, wholesale, and transportation. We're going to focus there because there's a concentration of the problem in those industries. Moreover, we've chosen to start in California, and that's mainly because of the stringent regulations from OSHA on companies who work or who are housed here. And we've started over in retail and manufacturing, mainly because of the relationships we have in those sectors. Now, the landscape for competitive solutions can be broken down in terms of effectiveness and in terms of and, and the types of changes they target. Now, there's a variety of solutions that a consultant can recommend, some more effective than others. However, these tools only work when they actually troubleshoot the right problem. Now, ergonomic, the ergonomic consulting industry today is highly fragmented because, the compet because basically the consultants out there use trial and error approaches and really use subjective prediction models to ba as the basis for the recommendation. So basically, there's no guarantee that these types of companies can accurately pinpoint or diagnose a client's problem ac or correctly. Thus, clients need, at, with the average cost of a back injury at $57,000 each, clients need a clear way to accurately identify and diagnose back injury problems. Clients need biodynamics technology. Now, Rena will tell you more about what we have to offer. Thank you, Michael. Our value proposition really lies in the fact that our recommendations are based on data. We use the lumbar motion monitor to provide this data. It consists of two components, a hardware and a software component. The hardware is an exoskeleton spine, which is harnessed on the back of an employee undergoing an assessment. It's, it's lightweight, and it transmits movement data wirelessly to our risk model software, which basically uses that data and measures it against five different factors which have been proven to properly identify back injury risk. Mm -hmm. Our software also contains a proprietary database with over 20 years worth of data that we've gathered from various assessments. The joint use of our hardware and software have been scientifically proven to be three times more effective than any other competing solutions, and it was even featured on Good Morning America. Let me stop for a moment and just provide an analogy to help illustrate our value. So let's say that you went to the doctor's office with a foot injury. Sure, he could try to make a guess at what was wrong with your foot, but not until he sent you in for an x-ray and actually got that data back would he actually be able to tell what was wrong with you. Like x-rays to a doctor, our lumbar motion monitor provides our expert consultants with the data that they need to accurately pinpoint the source of back injuries. And from that, they can provide the right recommendations to clients. Let me tell you more about our service offerings. 
So we're not in the business of selling the lumbar motion monitor device or any other ergonomic tools. We're a professional services company that provides two distinct offerings. The first is assessments, where we basically go into a client site and use our lumbar motion monitor device on a small set of employees for a given job type. And we, use, we basically collect the data. It's over a short duration of time, a couple of days to a week. And we basically collect the data, identify the back injury risk, and then work with clients to provide recommendations on how they can mitigate that risk. Our second service is validations, and here we work with clients to basically validate solutions before they deploy them on a company-wide basis. So let's say a client wants to deploy an anti-gravitational lift, lift table. Instead of, before purchasing 500 of these units, they can call upon our services just to validate the level of risk reduction they can expect to see after implementing these. In, in addition to clients, we expect that ergonomic tool manufacturers will leverage our services on a regular basis to help validate their solutions to their clients. Although our company was just formed in February of this year, this, this technology is not new. In fact, Dr. Maris, our co-founder, has been using this technology on over 1,000 different assessments with over 200 different clients. Clients have seen roughly 46% reduction in back injuries by using this technology and that equates to roughly $337,000 in savings per year per client. Honda Motor Corporation even recognized Dr. Maris and his team for reducing their back injuries by 70% over a five-year time frame. We've developed a comprehensive sales and marketing strategy which consists of a number of components, cold calling, attending trade shows, developing some marketing collateral, and building alliances. We see alliances as very core to our growth strategy to date, we're in the process of formalizing four different alliances, and we plan to continue doing this as we move forward. Our leadership team is spearheaded by Michael, who's our CEO, and Dr. William Maris, who's our CTO. Michael brings a wealth of experience as a management, former management consultant at Accenture, as well as a, a sales lead at Frito-Lay. And Dr. Maris invented the lumbar motion monitor technology. He's regarded by most to be the foremost expert in the field of ergonomics with over 25 years in the industry. And the combination of his expertise and reputation provide us with an unmatched advantage in this market. My name is Rena Chit and I'm the Director of Marketing and I also am a Product Manager at Cisco as well as a working professional in the GSM program. Dr. Gary Allred is our Director of Consulting Services, and he's worked with Dr. Maris for a number of years using the Lumbar Motion Monitor. In addition to our strong team, we're also supported by a very strong advisory board who have over 100 years of combined experience in public and private startups. Now let me turn it back over to Michael to talk about our operations. Thank you, Rena. So we started this company two months ago and we're currently seeking $350,000 in order to fund our working capital and our marketing needs. Next year, we plan to accelerate our growth through use of our formal alliances, through a stronger presence at trade shows, and by building upon the relationships that Dr. Maris has formed through all of the scientific studies he's done at client sites. In years three and four, we actually intend to continue to grow domestically while also aligning ourselves with some large insurance companies so that we can begin to target the smaller companies who don't self-insure as well. Moreover, we also plan to introduce a new service offering around this time. By year five, we're, we'll be looking for additional growth opportunities and we'll con begin to consider international expansion as well. Now, we actually project steady profits after we break even in year two and we're projecting profits of $8 million on $26 million in revenue by year five. Now you can see the drivers for our revenues and our costs uh, down below in blue and red, if you squint your eyes. Uh, but it's, it's, I think it's important to say that these projections don't really take into account the fact, or the new, uh, basically the sales that we'll gain through synergies with our alliance partners, nor do they account for the sales that we'll gain through the additional service offerings that we are planning to introduce. Allow me to tell you a little bit about our growth opportunities. So we, re we recognize that in order to stay ahead of the market, we're gonna need to continue to innovate and introduce new service offerings. So we're currently exploring the opportunity of using our technology and positioning at physical therapist sites 
so that companies can send their employees to get a, to get a physical capability screening when they're hired for a job to make sure that they can meet the demands of a job. We're still in early stages of exploring this opportunity. However, our initial estimates lead us to believe that this will be a great way to scale our business further. With our proven technology, our highly skilled technical team, and the clients we already have in the pipeline, Biodynamics technology is well positioned to create tremendous value for clients and investors alike. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Rena and Michael, and thank you again to all five of the teams that we've had the pleasure of listening to tonight. Um, at this point, you have heard from all five of the teams, so it's your turn to choose a winner. All right, as we continue to collect those, I'd like to introduce our final speaker, Kevin Coyle. Hello. Once again, welcome to the ninth, yes, the ninth annual installment of the UC Davis Big Bang Business Plan Competition. It is my distinct pleasure to have been associated with this program since its inception, and I can honestly say it has been a thoroughly enjoyable and enriching experience. It was in 1999 that Casey Kanan approached us and other members of the high-tech industry in the Sacramento Davis area with the idea of starting a student-run business plan competition similar to the many well-known competitions at institutions such as UC Berkeley, Stanford, Harvard, Rice, Notre Dame, and many others. The basic idea was to match up UC Davis business students with UC Davis technology, give the students a chance to pitch their ideas to angel and VC investors, maybe start an actual company or two, and have some fun. We obviously thought it was a good idea, and once GSM and the other sponsors got behind the program, it was launched. The goal was threefold. First, to provide a forum for educating students in the process of creating and evaluating new business ventures and preparing students for opportunities and entrepreneurship sometime during their careers, whether in startup companies or established businesses. Second, facilitate the interactions between local technology companies, seasoned angel and venture capital investors, service providers and other community resources, and university students and faculty. Third, create and grow startups that harness the unique research and entrepreneurial resources of UC Davis and its associated institutions. And the benefits of, of preparing and pitching a business plan as a necessary component of the fundraising process for a startup seems self-evident. As one commentator has noted, whether you want to shop your business plan to venture capitalists or attract angel investors, you need to have a solid business plan. A presentation may pique their interest, but they'll need a well-written document that they can take away and study before they'll be prepared to make an investment commitment. Be prepared for your business plan to be scrutinized. Both venture capitalists and angel investors will want to conduct extensive background checks and competitive analysis to be certain that, that what's written in your business plan is indeed the case. Writing a business plan is time consuming, but it's essential if you want to have a successful business that's going to survive the startup phase. If your business doesn't have one, maybe it's time to start working on one. The process of writing a business plan can do wonders to clarify where you've been and where you're going. Seems to make sense. And over the past nine years, Big Bang participants have dutifully churned out hundreds of business plans, covering everything from enterprise software, biotechnology and life sciences, medical devices and diagnostics, semiconductors, consumer products, internet businesses, nanotechnology, green and clean tech, restaurants, and yes, even rain skirts. And many of these business plans have provided the blueprint for successful companies. Just last week, however, an article was published in the New York Times that began as follows. Go ahead, write that 50-page business plan about your fledgling venture if it helps you to focus. Just do not bother showing it to venture capitalists because it will do nothing to improve your chances of getting financing. That is the surprising conclusion of a new study by researchers at the University of Maryland's Business School. Researchers found that venture capitalists who screen hundreds or thousands of solicitations each year pay little or no heed to the content of business plans. Instead, the study said, because they make decisions under conditions of high uncertainty, 
Venture capitalists rely on instinct and their expertise in ferreting out information by other means to evaluate the prospects of a business. That means, the study said, that they pay little attention to the documentation from entrepreneurs about their academic credentials, work or startup experience, previous success, success in raising venture capital, ability to perform a top-notch management team, or even how much money they want. In general, business plans don't matter, said Brent Goldfarb, an associate professor of management and entrepreneurship at the Robert H. Smith School of Business, who co-wrote the study. Nobody is going to read them. So thank you all very much for coming. <laughs> for those of you who submitted business plans, there's a dumpster out in the parking lot. For those of you who are foolish enough to sponsor this year, there will be a lavish party for the judges as soon as the room is cleared. <laughs> okay, so seriously, is there some truth to the notion that VCs don't read business plan? Maybe. The cosmic alignment of often opposing emotional and rational forces that ultimately results in a venture capital investment probably quite often does not include a detailed analysis of the entrepreneur's written business plan. It is also probably not susceptible to a reliable scientific study either, but that's a topic for another day. But does this mean that our little competition here is a waste of time, an exercise in futility, a classroom project with minimal value in the real world? Is the business plan dead? Of course not. Even the Michigan researchers acknowledge the other well-known benefits of preparing a business plan. Testing the feasibility of all aspects of the business, ferreting out weak points and likely challenges that the business will face, forcing a disciplined approach to the market and financial analysis and projections, and many others. The business plan remains a valuable and probably necessary component of a successful startup business. But not only that, we have the big bang competition, which I submit has value to not only the participants and judges, but also to the university and the community at large that goes far beyond the narrow focus of raising angel or venture capital. Let's go back and revisit those original goals we developed nine years ago. First, provide a forum for educating students in the process of creating and evaluating new business ventures, preparing students for opportunities in entrepreneurship. I think we can check that off the list. Second, facilitate interactions between local technology companies, seasoned angel and venture capital investors, service providers, community resources, students and faculty. Well, just look around the room and see, for that, see that for yourself. Third, create and grow startups that harness the unique research and entrepreneurial resources of UC Davis and its associated institutions. Well, I think we can check that one off the list too. There have been many new businesses started from the Big Bang process. In fact, a local Big Bang finalist is from a couple of years ago is just a few days away from closing a significant new money venture round in a very difficult funding environment. And beyond that, many budding entrepreneurs who participated in Big Bang over the years have gone on to new ventures, which, while they may not have been Big Bang companies, have benefited from the experience of our participants. And what about this year? Looks to me like we have five pretty good companies. I mean, I can envision the day, not so long in the future, when the only business still viable really is wine. <laughs> so imagine I'm tending my Cabernet Franc vineyard that has been perfectly watered by the latent harvest system, my grapes enriched by water cleaned to perfection by Davis's Ultra V enabled treatment plant, but because Davis would not allow a Walmart, I was not able to check my eyes at a Vision Quest kiosk, <laughs> and I tripped and fell, injuring my back, an injury that could easily have been prevented had I followed my biodynamics consultant's recommendations. However, all was not lost, as my brand new Armani pants were unharmed <laughs> thanks to my trusty emergent design rain skirt. The, the skirts are for bold men only, right? Is that <laughs> so congratulations to all of the finalists and indeed to all of the participants in the 2009 Big Bang Business Plan competition. Whether you win a prize or not, made the finals or not, know that, to quote Teddy Roosevelt, the credit belongs to those who are actually in the arena, who know the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who, sp who spend themselves for a worthy cause, who at the best know the triumph of high achievement and who at the worst fail while daring, while daring greatly. 
so that their place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who knew neither victory nor defeat. Thanks also to all the judges. These are all incredibly busy individuals who give huge amounts of valuable time to this process, not just today, but throughout the school year, because like me, they believe in entrepreneurship at UC Davis. <laughs> and thanks also again to this year's student organizers, who once again have somehow managed to continue to improve this competition while actually completing their MBAs. Amazing job, everyone. And finally, I thought perhaps I'd leave you to consider the comments of uh, one of the partners at a VC firm in, in Massachusetts, which provides seed money for young businesses. According to the New York Times article, he agreed with the Maryland study's main premise. I've never given funding to an entrepreneur who had a business plan with him when he walked into my office, he said. He says he looks for market validation, hard evidence that the entrepreneur has actually sold his product or at least lined up enthusiastic potential customers. He says that rather than reading a report, he wants to hear the evidence in PowerPoint slides, whiteboard presentations, or somebody just talking. It's an interesting perspective. I thought you might also like to know that this particular VC is a longtime sponsor and judge at the MIT Annual Business Plan Competition. <laughs> well, thanks very much. All right, thank you, Kevin. And um, now we are at the point in our presentation that we have all been waiting for. Um, I am going to announce the people's choice first, then Adelina will announce the runner-up, and finally um, I will announce the winner of the Big Bang competition. Um, so before I get started, I'd like to ask the winning teams to please come on stage to collect their checks when they are announced. All right, uh, with no further ado, can I have the envelope for the People's Choice? Drum roll, please. <laughs> I am happy to announce that the People's Choice winner is Emergent Designs. The runner-up of the competition is... Sorry. <laughs> Biodynamics. Congratulations. All right, and now for the moment we've all been waiting for. The winner of the ninth annual Big Bang competition is Ultra V. Well, congratulations again to all of our winners, and thank you very much for, um, to all of our sponsors, mentors, judges, and all of our other supporters we've had, and thank you for coming, and good night. <laughs> <laughs>